Sometimes the best stories in golf aren't found on tour. You'll find them at the back of the range. And here's your host, Ben Adelberg. Welcome to the back of the range. I am your host, Ben Adelberg. This is episode 81. This week's episode released a little early this week so that everyone can take a listen and then get focused on the 4th of July. Hope everyone has a great holiday. Enjoy the long holiday weekend, so to speak. Let's get the podcast housekeeping stuff out of the way quickly. You know, we're all stocked up on merch. We have our trucker hats back in stock. We have towels, teeth, ball markers. It's a ton of great stuff available. So if you'd like to rock it on the course this summer, please visit the website, thebackoftherange.com. That's where you can pick up all of this stuff for you or a friend or both. So remember, this just helps get the word out on the podcast. So if you've enjoyed it so far, your support is always appreciated. You know, I'm working on a couple other projects this summer. I think everyone is really going to enjoy them. It's definitely in the early stages, but you'll know it when you see it. So please make sure that you're following along on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. All the links are available in the show notes of this episode. The reviews keep flying in each and every week. I can't thank you enough for that. Please keep them coming. You know, when I'm stuck behind the computer editing for hours at a time and I get a new review in, it really does help keep pushing me through. So please keep sending them. And yes, post them online, tag the back of the range, and let everyone know that you follow the podcast. So on to this week's episode and another awesome example that the back of the range mojo is real. So if you're not aware of what this whole phenomenon is, it seems that anytime a guest comes on the podcast or has agreed to be on the podcast, great things tend to happen for that person on the golf course. So whether it's Blair Hamilton Monday qualifying for the Waste Management Open this year, or Todd Mitchell winning his first USGA event at this year's four ball, or Scott Harvey picking up another Thomas Invitational at LACC, again, All of these people have been guests on the podcast this year, and the mojo is real. It just helped out our guest this week, Chris Ventura. Chris was a three-time All-American at Oklahoma State University. He was part of last year's national championship team that featured Austin Eckroat, Zach Boshu, Matt Wolf, and Victor Hovland. So I think everyone knows Victor Hovland's name by now. He won the USAM last year. He had an incredible performance at the Masters and the U.S. Open. So how did Victor from Norway get all the way to Oklahoma State? Well, Chris Ventura was there before him. He's from Norway as well, and I think he helped forge the path to Oklahoma State. So when Chris got a sponsor's exemption to the BMW event on the Corn Ferry Tour, I was able to speak with him about Oklahoma State, his up and down path as a professional thus far, and what the rest of the year was looking like for him. Well, that's all changed because this past weekend, he won the Utah Championship with a comfort behind victory, and he actually closed it out on the third hole of sudden death. So you're going to see a lot more of Chris for the rest of this season on the Corn Ferry Tour. You're probably going to see him on the PGA Tour next year. So it's an excellent time to get to know him. Chris, thanks for joining me. Welcome to the back of the range. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, before we get started, I am going to offer you the the same thing that I offered your countryman Victor Hovland for for people listening to <laughs> for people listening to the back of the range that that have listened to to Victor's episode. I know that you listen to it as well. Since uh, since he's a fellow countryman, you're both from Norway. I I was kind enough to give him the offer where if I asked him a dumbass question, he can just reply in Norwegian and just, you know, that will be my cue that, okay, that's been asked several times. So I'm going to do the same thing for you, sir. Okay. Sounds good. (laughs) So, um, I love getting into how people get into the game, um, where they get their start, how they get their start. So our listeners might know a little bit, they might know that you're from Norway, but can you share with them how you got into the game of golf? Well, um, first of all, I, uh, was born in Mexico and, uh, lived there until I was 12 years old. And, um, uh, obviously we moved to Norway in 2007. So, uh, yeah, my start was in Mexico. I started when I was between two and three, I think. Sure. Um, and it was funny because I think just one day I was watching golf on TV and happened to pick up one of those, uh, big kitchen spoons and I started like hitting stuff, like just hitting, like 
you know, anything. And then, uh, I got, you know, plastic clubs for Christmas that year or the following year. And that's how it started. So I'm sure mom must've loved the fact that you're just terrorizing her kitchen with all of, uh, with plastic spoons and wooden spoons flying all over the place. What was the junior golf experience in Mexico, maybe versus Norway? Like did, was there a big jump in maybe the competition or maybe your level of commitment to the game? I think I just started at a, like a regional level or even local. And then once I was old enough to compete in tournaments, I think I was six or seven and they had uh, like a six and seven uh, age group or whatever. And, um, but yeah, I mean, as, as a kid, obviously my parents knew that I was very good. None of my parents played golf or even, you know, my, my dad plays a little golf now, but back then, back then they didn't. So, yeah, I mean, I just started winning a bunch of tournaments and started competing, you know, nationally and then eventually internationally. When I was, I think, seven, I won the U.S. kids uh, for my age, and that kind of uh, set the tone for the rest of my junior career. And But, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think my dad or my mom knew what they were getting into with the traveling and all the expenses and all that. Yeah. Uh, but it was, yeah, I mean, looking back at it, it was, you know, everything was definitely worth it. Comparing that to Norway, obviously, when I was in Mexico, I, I think I won, uh, I don't know, something like 25 or 26 tournaments in a row. Oh, gosh. Uh, so it was like the course of like four or five years. I went undefeated. So um, so the kids in Mexico probably were not too upset to see you leave and go to Norway. <laughs> I know, I know. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, it's funny because looking – I mean, I know a few of the guys that I used to play against, and uh, I see them now, you know – even in college, a couple that I knew, and yeah, they're like, "Oh <laughs> God, pretty... we got to run against this kid again in college." <laughs> exactly. So, uh, but it was fun, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm glad that we still uh, keep in touch, and it's it's awesome because um, I, I don't get to go back to Mexico very often, and so obviously I haven't seen a bunch of my friends in a long time. Sure. Uh, so, uh, but then coming to Norway, obviously. Uh, my dad says that part of the, the reason why we went to Norway was because of the golf. Uh, so I don't know if I believe him. Uh, obviously, my mom is Norwegian, so maybe uh, they just wanted to, you know, go back to Norway or whatever. <laughs> so you're – and what age are you going back to Norway? What is this, about 13, 12, 13? I was, yeah, 12, yeah. So you get to Norway. You never – I'm assuming you've never been there or never really spent much time there. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think we, we, we used to go, uh, once a year, I think maybe, okay. maybe once every two years just to visit my grandparents. But yeah, me, I mean, mainly, you know, the biggest, my family in Mexico is obviously a lot bigger than my family, family in Norway, sure. my dad's. So, uh, but we used to go, I don't remember much of it. I remember, you know, it, we would go in the winter, it would be a lot of snow. We would go skiing and all that, but. Right. Vacation other, stuff, not living there, playing golf, trying to. Yeah. So. Yeah. Interesting. So you get to Norway coming from, I mean, what were, what were the differences for, Hey, we have a lot of listeners that like going on golf trips and, and, you know, I just got <laughs> back from Casa de Campo in the Dominican. And no. so what were some of the differences with getting your game acclimated, which you're having to do now as a professional traveling all over the world, you have to kind of tailor your game to the course and the grass and the, the climate. What was yeah. the learning curve when you go from Mexico to Norway? Honestly, it was everything but golf. Okay. <laughs> it was, All right, fair it enough. was, uh, yeah, I mean, golf, you know, if you're good somewhere, you're going to be good in, in Norway or whatever that is. Okay. Um, the, the hardest part was just the, you know, learning the language and, you know, getting new friends, get on, getting like settled in the culture, the, and obviously the climate, you know, coming from, from uh, Mexico where you can play, you know, all year. Right. In Norway, we only played, I think six or seven months. Uh, so, uh, and then the rest was spent indoors practicing and hitting the ball, maybe, you know, 20, 30 yards. So, um, yeah. yeah, that was, that was a big, uh, change for, for, for me when we moved to Norway for sure. And, uh, but as a kid, I guess you, you uh, adapt to things uh, quickly. So, uh, and I'm fortunate enough to where languages are, are pretty easy for me. So I think within like seven months, I, I was speaking uh, Norwegian oh, fluent. Oh, gosh. All right. So I'm yeah. talking to a guy that languages are easy for, golf <laughs> is easy for. Wow. I'm really, uh, you're, re you're really buttering up the host of the podcast here, but that's okay. Well, go golf used to be easy. <laughs> oh, come on. Come on. Well, <laughs> well, now, well, now you're in the pro ranks where you're, you're yeah. basically with all those, I mean, 
you know, all the Chris, you know, Chris Ventura's as a kid, now they're all at that tour that you're playing at. So you're, you're Mm -hmm. playing against the best of the best. Now you had all these great experiences as an amateur, even before you made it to Oklahoma state. And we'll kind of get into that, but we're talking about world amateur teams, you know, European nations cup, uh, played in a junior Ryder cup in 2010. So let's see if Mm -hmm. my memory is correct in 2010, uh where where was it in 2010 uh glenn eagles glenn eagles that was that wasn't k club that was 2006 so k club was okay so now i got it so 2010 is when paven was the captain for the u.s team um Mm -hmm. that was the year of those bad rain suits that the u.s had wasn't it uh yeah so i think the way it works is you play like we played glenn eagles and then the Ryder cup was going to be there uh four years from from the like the tournament yeah. So we uh, we played uh, yeah we played at Glen Eagles that week, and then we flew to uh, Celtic Manor and that and we watched the guys and we got uh, we got to play a practice round at that course behind all the European players. So that was pretty cool. Any particular player that was your favorite at the time that kind of jumped out that that really um, whether they were on the Junior Ryder Cup team with you or or maybe on the on the the main team. You know, have you always been a follower of of Ryder Cup? Oh, for sure, and and especially, you know, it's I couldn't believe it until I got to Celtic Manor and saw, like, actually said hi to some of the the players that I've always watched on TV. Right. Um. So yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, Lee Westwood and and uh, Rory McIlroy and all those guys, uh, Sergio, we got to meet him, and that was pretty awesome. We didn't get to meet the U.S. players, maybe that was on purpose, uh, but. Yeah, I mean, it was it was awesome, and just being a spectator. I, as soon as I got there, I, I thought, you know, this is where I want to be. Like yeah. that's that's probably the moment when I realized that it got it got a little real for me, and that's when I realized that yeah, if if I keep doing this and I keep getting better, like this is a uh, for sure uh, a, a possibility. Well, it's it is interesting when you really look at at the Junior Ryder Cup. I know it gets maybe a little bit of a a very small attention, uh, you know, in the grand scheme of things because it's just it's just such a a massive event that the Ryder Cup, but but you're there. I mean, I'm looking at some of the names that were there. I mean, Spieth is on the U S team. Justin Thomas is on the U S team. Denny McCarthy, Allison Lee. I mean, these are just names, you know, uh, I mean, it's, it's massive that, that who's there. And, and I I can't imagine what kind of experience that is to be there. And I mean, you haven't even started college and you're just looking at like, okay, this is where I want to go. Speaking of college, how did everything get, off the ground and started for you at Oklahoma state being in Norway. So it's kind of a, a bumpy ride there. I, um, I first committed to Arizona state. Uh, I don't remember the exact date, but it was early and obviously playing Europe, traveling with the national team. There are a few of the coaches that always made, uh, made it to the tournaments over there. So we kind of developed a relationship, even though we probably couldn't talk to them. Uh, we kind of knew they were there and, it was always like the Arizona state coach, a TCU coach, a couple other coaches. And, um, I mean, obviously I always had, had in the back of my mind that I wanted to go to college. Sure. And obviously if you're good enough and can turn pro before that, I, I thought that was a big bonus, but looking back at it, I was, I would have been way too immature to turn pro before college. Right. Um, uh, so, so yeah. And then, uh, I decommitted and, um, uh, I think had about four or five months to make another decision. And, that's when I first got introduced to uh, Coach Braden. He was over in Scotland with, uh, I think it was there by himself. But, yeah, I mean, he was watching us play uh, the European Boys Team Championship. And, uh, it, I mean, it so happened that Victor was there, too. And he was, I mean, he's two years younger than me, so we, yeah. we were small. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so I met him. I had a meeting with him. And after that, I talked to a couple of former players, um, OSU players, that is. And Oh, sure. I, yeah, I just I just committed. You know, I I, I talked to uh, mainly to Pablo Martin. Okay. He uh, he was a really good player in college and uh, won a couple times on the European tour. And um, I I was fortunate enough to play a couple of challenge tour events with him in Norway and uh, had dinner with him. And you know, from there on, I I basically just committed. You know, took his word for it. And he said, 
you know, if, if you want to go to college, Oklahoma State is a spot. You know, I'm not just telling you because I went there, but right. just that's just the way it is. <laughs> well, and and I think anyone listening that obviously people, we just got done with the NCAAs, everyone you know, that follows college golf that, that's seen the last couple of years. I mean, you're, you guys won the national championship at Carson Creek last year. Um, mm-hmm. You know, Oklahoma State very close to getting right back in that final this year. You know, take the facilities off the off the table because you know every big name school now has the great facilities. You know they can mm-hmm. they're they're comparable here and there. Do you remember what some of the selling points were that 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 Pablo mentioned, whether it be Coach Bratton or the culture? I guess I'm trying to just understand that. Yeah, it's a big massive golf school, but what are maybe some of the things that you saw that really attracted you to the place um, to get to really feel comfortable there. First of all, I looked at former players, like all the players have gone through. Oh yeah. They're out on tour. And you know, that was pretty obvious that obviously there's, there's something they're doing right. Sure. Uh, obviously being a Ricky fan and just, I mean, basically what Pablo spoke to was just the, the culture. Uh, you know, you don't go there if you're not serious about golf. You know, if I, if I wanted to party or if I wanted to uh, have fun, I probably would have gone somewhere else right? Uh, and had a good time, I'm sure. Um, but I, I want to be, I wanted to be a golfer. I want to be a golfer. So that was probably, yeah, probably one of the best decisions that I've made so far. And uh, other than that, he didn't mention any, any specifics. Uh, he didn't mention the facilities. When I uh, first um, spoke to Coach Brad and he uh, wasn't selling the facilities like all the other coaches were. Okay. Interesting. Because you know every coach is going to tell you, "Oh, we have the best yeah. putting greens, we have the get best best course." So, uh, and Coach Brown was very low key about it. You know, he told me our facilities are fine, the course is fine, and the school is fine. And, you know, and I think you're going to like it. And that was different uh, because I'd, I'd spoken to a bunch of coaches, and I thought that was a little odd that he wasn't selling it. You know, he kind of let the the results and the culture speak for itself. Interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that, I thought that was really. Uh, interesting and end up committing there and once i took my visit uh i, I mean i realized how crazy it was <laughs> okay so yeah i can't i can't let you get away with that so when you say crazy um yeah i mean yeah you got to take your, your coursework but I, i'm just thinking about like all the studs that are on that team i mean even just your senior year you got you know you got mm-hmm. wolf and you got hovland and and, and zach and ekro i mean you got all these and, and wood and all these great players how do you keep a team dynamic where you're chasing the same thing, but also in the back of your mind, you know that you're that all of you want to get to the same spot as an individual. You want to win tournaments. You want to turn pro. You're you're kind of I guess you're sizing up. You're, you know, sizing these guys up. It is I mean, take us inside the locker room, so to speak. You know how how do you guys coexist on a week to week basis? It was quite quite a journey, especially me. Uh... I always had, you know, Wyndham Clark was there and Jordan Newbury was there when I got there, some of the older guys. And just, I mean, how do you get, you know, 10 strangers to, uh, you know, almost play for each other every week and uh, practice together and get along? I mean, that's not, that can't be easy. Right. I mean, it just Um, because you guys are wearing the same shirt and carry the same bag, it doesn't mean that you're all, you know, best buddies all the time. I mean, I know you get along. (laughs) I know, I know. Right. I mean, at some point you're like, shit, man, this guy is just, I mean, I need a break from this guy. Yeah. And and that's what, I mean, that was a reality, obviously. Yeah. You know, but that's, that's what happens. I mean, we spent so much time with each other. It was, I mean, it was basically all day, all day together. We (laughs) practiced together. Some of us went to classes together. We lived together. We ate together. You know, we almost, we did homework together. I mean, it was, you know, just the only break you got was when you went went to bed, you know? Yeah. I mean, could you form friendships outside of the team or was it just like a bubble where like, I'm, I mean. I think you can for sure, but I didn't. Okay. <laughs> it was just too much uh, work. I, yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't think Victor did or a few of the other guys did. It's so hard because you don't have time. Yeah. Uh, so obviously the only, the only friends that I had and the only people I knew were the, were, was my golf team or yeah, my teammates. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I knew some of the other athletes, but I mean, really just didn't have time. And, um, so that, I mean, that obviously that was tough, but you know, with that, we, I mean, we created a bond that's, you know, pretty much led to us, you know, whatever we did last year and whatever some of the guys did this year, um, uh, and um, I thought it was going to be like, obviously it was really competitive, but 
once you get there, you know, it's going to end, you know, in four years, this is going to be over. Yeah. So, so you want to play for each other and try to accomplish as much as possible in those four years. Cause then after that, you're on your own. And that's what the coaches kept telling us. Uh, and I mean, looking back at it, I, I mean, it's only been a year and I already missed it. Just, just the whole atmosphere. Cause now you're traveling by yourself, you, you know, sometimes you eat by yourself and, um, I mean, it's tough it, or, or it can be tough sometimes. And, uh, like back in college, not, no worries. You just, you know, wake up, practice, go to school and play a tournament and, you know, do the same thing next week. So I have to ask. You're a 2018 national champion at Oklahoma State. A lot of the guys on that team were on this year's team. Where were you during this year's semifinal match? Yeah, I missed. Uh, I think I, yeah, I was, I was doing a Monday qualifier and I missed. And I was like, oh, at least I get to watch some some my teammates play. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I sat on the couch and, and watched the whole thing. But when it came down to like the pressure putts, I just I just couldn't watch. I, I felt like I was gonna throw up because I, that's probably the most nervous that I've been watching golf on TV. Um, and just because I know all the work that goes behind it and especially with how well the guys were playing and they won by 31. And oh, I, I mean, the, the expectations, even last year, they were through the roof. Um, and last year we were fortunate to come out on top, but I mean, anything can happen to match play, you know, you can go shoot four under and lose on the, on the 15th hole. Um, and yeah, that, that was brutal. I, I told my girlfriend, I, I, you know, I said, just let me know what happened. You know, just, I don't want to watch anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and then when I didn't hear anything, I, I, I you know, you know. figured out it was, it, it was something bad, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's golf. I mean, that, that happens, I guess. When you, um, when you were there for the national championship at Carson Creek, I mean, you have, you know, home course advantage, you have fans, you have it all out there. Um, I'm sure you're incredibly energized by that. And it's just got to be mm-hmm. an incredible feeling to have it just, I mean, you just have it all behind you. Did any of you, did you or any of your teammates just kind of step back and say, Oh my gosh, this, this is, this is bigger than just this team. This is just, we're playing for legacy. We're playing yeah. for guys like, you know, Pablo Martin and Ricky Fowler and Bob Tway. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we're playing for, it, did did that ever hit, or did you guys kind of were you able to con, con, you know zone in a little bit more and just kind of get it done? Obviously, we had a lot of time to think about it because yeah. everything was kind of leading up to that with the TV show and you know our results. I mean, I think we won, I think it was like seven, eight tournaments in a row yeah. in the spring. And you know, I, I was telling the guys because sometimes it's not good to think about like, oh yeah, we're gonna win, oh yeah, and we like, you know just, like, but at some point we just i mean it just happened like okay we just realized you know what like everyone thinks we're gonna win like we know we're good enough so might as well just you know start telling ourselves you know what this is gonna happen um and that and Boshu was kind of big into that okay uh coach coach star and coach brown always you know preached that that just talk about what you want to happen not what you don't want to happen and yeah i mean that's that's what we did and uh i think you know all the fans that were out there had a huge impact i think uh, all the support, a lot of for, former golfers were out there watching us, and it just made it, you know, so special. Like looking back at it, I don't, I haven't really had that much time to think of, about what happened. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it, I don't think you could, you know, make it any better that whole the whole week. Um, so it it was really special, and and just just knowing, I mean, the feeling you get when you've talked about something for you know years and work towards something and then to actually do it. Um, there's, there's nothing better than that. So that, that'll probably be one of my favorite memories, like for a long time. So the one thing I want to ask you is you transition out of college, you transition away from Oklahoma state as a national champion. And, you know, I follow the team on Facebook and Instagram and I see, you know, you guys win a tournament. There's always that shot of the team together with the trophy on the private jet. And I'm just, one of the things I'm thinking about is like, okay, you spend four years and if you're playing and traveling, you're not worried about travel. Someone's telling you what time to be where and the bus or the the plane's going to pick you up and Cowboys are flying in style. It's not like you're trying to get a, you know, a, you're not on standby on some, you know, jet blue flight trying to figure out a way to connect from Boise to, to Akron to God knows where. So yeah. when, when did it really hit you after you turned pro? What was the first maybe travel snafu that you had that you're like, 
oh man, I'm not in Stillwater anymore. I don't have a travel agent. Like what, what happened here? Where'd it go? I probably had the roughest of starts as a pro just oh yeah you talk about travel and all that because i went to the challenge tour for a month and a half i think and you go from like and basically even before college traveling with a national team they just sent you your schedule and you show up at the airport and you didn't even know where you were going pretty much uh so yeah i mean on the challenge tour you just you book a hotel you get there it's not it doesn't have ac like doesn't have wi-fi or anything like that and you have to drive you know an hour and a half from the airport it's it can be tough, you know, and especially if you're, if you're complaining all the time and if you're, you know, everything is, is going bad. That's like, if you have that mentality, it's going to be really tough for you. Oh, so, of course, yeah. yeah, I mean, in a matter of a couple of weeks, I just realized, you know what, I'm not going to worry about the things that I can't control and I'm going to do my best finding the good spots. And, um, I mean, just a- approaching it a little different. Uh, and obviously when, when it's your money being, being spent on flights and hotels, rental cars, it's a little different. You start, you start going, well, I mean, I could drive to that tournament. It's only four hours away or, you know, like, <laughs> let's take, let's take this flight at 6am instead of the, you know, the noon flight and sure. save like, you know, three, $400. So that, that's what I realized when, when it's your money that it's being spent on, on, on all that stuff, you, you worry a little, a little more. Uh, right. So, so you're cutting, so you're trying to cut corners on travel and, 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 uh, you know, trying to save cash that way. Yeah. Um, you know, you have, you have a team behind you, you have an agent, I'm sure you have a lot of other, um, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's, it's trainers, nutritionists, things like that, just keeping you in the best shape possible. Um, you turn pro I'm curious, what is your mindset or how do you strategically put yourself in the best shape to you know get status whether it be on the web or on the european tour what what was the did you guys have a sit down meeting so to speak and figure out okay here's my here's the strategy for this year yeah no i mean when i did that with my with my agent or the yeah the management company i said i want to play on the pga tour so let's let's build build a plan for that okay um and obviously you can get there you know many different ways but uh, we thought the fastest way would be through the web.com. You okay. know, you, you, you go to Q school, you play a year on the web.com and then, you know, hopefully you're top 25 and then you're on the PJ tour. Right. Yeah. That's... But I mean, I found out pretty quickly that that's not how everything works. You know, like you can, you can have a thousand plans and, you know, I mean, nothing really goes according to plan. That's what I've learned. Uh, in the, you know, the year that I've been a professional, <laughs> Uh, you can plan that you're going to do this and that, and you're going to play good here and there. And then, you know, something would happen to where you have to like adapt and be pretty flexible. So, um, so yeah. And that was tough on me. Yeah. Looking back at this first year that, you know, I had planned, obviously I'm going to go to Q school. I'm going to, you know, play great on the web.com and I'm going to be a PGA tour member next year. Uh, and then obviously what all, everything that happened, uh, before, final stage of Q school or other tournaments where I was planning on playing really good because my game was ready and all that. And I had two, uh, high, uh, expectations and ended up playing bad. So that's, so that's basically what it's, what it's been like this last year. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned, you know, web, you know, Q school and you know, you, <laughs> I gotta, I gotta have you share this story. I mean, I'm sure it's, I, I, I mean, cause so I'll just let you share the story because I know I know what the story is. But you started yeah. at, at Q School, and I think first stage you you finished like eighth. I think you shot just something. I mean, well, I did I did pre qualifying too. <laughs> oh, okay, my fault. So you did pre Q, and then you yeah. get to first stage, and I believe in first stage you you were you, you top ten with a, with a lot of mid sixty mm-hmm. rounds. So yeah, I'll let you pick it up from there. So you go to second stage. Yeah, no, I mean every stage I was playing good. And I knew that if I just, if I'm just myself, I'll get through this. No problem. Right. Uh, Cause half the field is going to be so nervous and they're going to be thinking about, you know, what's going to, you know, already think about final stage before they even play pre-qualifying or first stage. And right. so I just figured if I just stay calm and, and do my own thing, I'll be fine. Like, you know, I really, I have to do something crazy to mess this up <laughs> and it worked. I mean, it, it really worked until final stage. I, I was, you know, getting through pretty easy not winning, but I was, you know, top 10 or fifth or yeah, or 10th or something. And, uh, 
yeah, once I got to final stage, uh, well, the week prior to that, I was in Florida practicing and looking at a place to, uh, because I moved to Florida uh, early this year. So I was looking at, uh, you know, apartments and stuff like that. And, uh, yeah, it just so happened that my, uh, I had to had my uh, my appendix removed <laughs> the the Monday before the the tournament. So you, so, uh, so yeah, yeah, so you spend the whole year getting yourself ready for this one time that you get this shot yeah. to get your card, and yeah. you have the most random medical thing happen that you can't mm-hmm. even. It's not even work related. It's not a golf injury. It's just this random thing. Yeah, uh, which is so crazy about our about the game of golf because. You know, if I have my appendix out, you know, I can get time off work and I still get paid and I got all that taken care of. And mm-hmm. even in in other sports, you know, you sign a contract, but there's no guarantees in golf. So no. you ended up playing final stage. But obviously, I, I mean, was it just so weak and just so off, just not practicing and just weren't yourself, I'm assuming? It was mentally, it was really tough because uh, I had looked forward to this for, for a long time and once I made it through second stage, I thought, well, at least I'm over the hump. You know, at least I have web status, uh, which turns out that if you don't finish like pretty high, it really doesn't mean much other than that your points count towards uh, towards the reshuffles and stuff like that. So, but I, I thought, you know, even if I make it to final stage, I'll get a couple of events and I'll have, you know, a couple of chances to, uh, to play good and, and maybe reshuffle and, and get more events. But, no, I mean, a lot of the guys that were at final stage, you know, we've all been doing Monday qualifiers this year. And so uh, that was that was really tough. And I don't know, I don't know if I'm I'm over it yet, but uh, okay. it's, it's it's hard not to feel, you know, yeah, sorry for yourself. But uh, I mean, it just happens. Like, like I said, you can't control that. And um, I told the doctor, I was like, hey, can I can you give me something so at least I can play? And I promise I'll come back and, you know, come back for surgery. <laughs> uh and he's he they just laughed in my face <laughs> like, yeah, uh, dude, we can't uh yeah they're like no you, you could die die if you don't uh if we don't get get it removed so uh yeah i mean and, and i ended up playing because he said you know there's no worst case for you right now like your problem is in a jar somewhere so the only thing is you know you can't practice until the first day of the tournament so yeah that was that was that was tough and i ended up playing i i was hitting my driver about like 240 250 oh, and God. way way offline and which that course you know if you can just hit in the fairway you're gonna shoot on the par you know you're gonna shoot four or five on the par every day because uh, you're gonna have wedges all day long and i just hit in the desert a bunch and i mean i ended up shooting two under for four rounds which i thought was pretty decent for where i was yeah. the, the previous monday but i ended up only beating like five six people oh so this is one of those like 26 under 27 under just birdie fest I, yeah things. i yeah. think i think 18 under was like uh top 40 or something like yeah. 16 under 18 under so you've, you've played european challenge tour i know you're doing monday qualifiers i know down here in south florida you've played uh played the minor league golf tour you know we had scott mm-hmm. turner who, who runs it he, he was uh he was on talking about that tour what kind of golf suits you the most? Are you the birdie machine that likes that that gets gets to sixty three, sixty four, and just you know puts the pedal down, or do you think your game fits more for the ball striker U.S. Open setup? Like, what would you say is your game, so to speak? I would say it's more the the second the second one, the okay. U.S. Open, like tough cores, tough conditions. That's more more my what suits me the best. But I'm trying to make it so that any any you know course suits me the best really (laughs) sure well i mean and and you have the ability Uh, to go low and i'm always fascinated by players that like for for us amateurs we get to two under or or even par we have a great round going or or whatever it is we get in our comfort zone and we're like okay if i can just keep my hands on the wheel and just guide it into the into the house i can (laughs) shoot 72 or i can shoot 70 or maybe i break 70 for the first time ever um, mm-hmm. are you consciously, do you have anything set up in your mind consciously where you're like, okay, I'm at four, I want to get to six or I'm at six. I want to get to eight. Or is that just natural to you? Like you just look at every hole as uh, I, this is just a birdie hole. Every hole is a birdie hole. Well, it depends. Obviously. Uh, when I play full tournaments, I think about, I'm just going to play every hole the best that I can. And whatever the ball ends up, I'll do my best from there. But when I've been playing the Monday qualifiers, I mean, you tee off at 1230 and half the field is already in and you got to shoot 
you know, seven, seven hundred to get into a playoff. Uh, so now you got, you can't, you know, be four under and just, you know, right. You know, get to the last hole and be like, I'm just going to make part here because 60 is going to look really good on online, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you basically, you just have to, you know, have the mindset that I'm going to be aggressive today. I'm going to play smart. I'm not going to make any dumb mistakes, but seven under is where it's at or eight under. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's a mentality. And obviously I haven't been very successful at that this year. I've only Monday in once. And I think I've probably played maybe nine, nine Monday qualifiers, nine or 10. And yeah, I mean, you know, seven, 700 makes it, you know, every time 600 uh, has made it a couple of times, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's a mindset and it's been tough for me because I would say the weakest part of my game is uh, wedges. So anything under 150 yards, it's not, it's not terrible, but it's not good enough. Right. You want and some that's tap-ins. where I've, yeah, I've always focused more on my swing and long game and, uh, and all that. And I haven't paid that much attention to wedges and distance control. And I mean, even some short game, my short game is pretty good. But mainly, mainly wedges, because I, I hit the ball plenty far, so I'm gonna have more wedges than most people, and I need to take advantage of that. I can't, you know, if I'm I have if I have 80 yards in, and someone else has 120, like I, I should have a huge advantage, and uh, that's that's where that's where I need to improve. If I do that, you know, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be a lot easier. What are uh, maybe some of the things that you've picked up this year? from other pros chasing it, maybe some, some guys that are, you know, five, 10 years older than you. Uh, have you gravitated towards any of these guys? You mentioned that you kind of miss the camaraderie and the team atmosphere from Oklahoma state. Have you mm-hmm. been able to maybe somehow replicate that or get something similar where you have a few guys that you can, you know, go to dinner with or, or share ideas with, um, or, or get some advice from, I mean, it's, it's not that easy. Uh, obviously, a lot of the players are in, in Jupiter and, and Palm Beach and West Palm. Um, but everyone travels, everyone's on different tours, everyone's playing different schedules. So it's not that easy to, uh, to make that happen. But I've been fortunate enough to uh, where, where I can play with Ricky a couple of times whenever he's home. And, and obviously that is very helpful because he's a top 10 player in the world. And sure. I get to see firsthand, like what, what he does and where I need to improve. And, uh, that's usually what works best for me watching someone that's that I'm trying to uh, hopefully be one day uh, and then see, well, I mean, my game is not that far off or maybe see, well, he, he hits his long irons a lot better than I do, or he puts a lot better than I do. So that's always the best. Instead of someone just telling you like, this is what they do. It's, it's a lot better for me to get a visual. You know, it, it's funny you bring up uh, Ricky Fowler because I think a lot of people that are casual uh, followers of the game of golf will see. You know, uh, he's he's very into fashion. He's very he's 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 got the the sponsors and the commercials and and very active on social media. Mm-hmm. Um, so we probably see just the off time. I'm sure yeah. you've been around him when he is you know not just competing in a tournament but but doing the things at home on an off week working is there a way Mm -hmm. you can take maybe share with listeners what a what a practice day with ricky fowler looks like or even what your practice day looks like i haven't i haven't practiced like a whole day with ricky because usually when he's been home i mean i'm sure he just plays 18 and then goes home or wants to relax or whatever um so every time that i've played with him we usually just play 18 holes you know warm up play 18 holes and then and then do our own thing. Um, so that's, I mean, that that could be a good thing because probably a lot of people think that all the guys, you know, when they're not playing tournaments, they, they play 18 holes and then they practice for four hours and they work out and they do all this. And surprising, a lot of the guys, you know, value uh, rest and downtime. And I'm sure a lot of the guys have families and they want to spend time with them and stuff. So, right. Yeah, you know, growing up, I always, you know, you see these players as like gods, you know, pretty much. So like, yeah. oh, they they're like machines. They practice, you know, ten hours a day, and they shoot sixty five every time. Um, and you know, surprisingly, it's been more of the opposite, really. You know, when when they're at tournaments, they do their work and do what's work works for them, and then they believe in it a hundred percent. But I would assume when they're home, it's just a lot of you know, relaxing, hanging out with the family or friends or whatever. 
and whatever they do with their practice, they're really efficient. You know, they'll, they'll go ahead, you know, practice for an hour, maybe play nine holes at 18 and then just go home. Sure. Well, you mentioned, you mentioned downtime, you know, you're at, uh, you're at the BMW charity pro-am in South Carolina this week. Mm-hmm. Um, I know you're gonna, after you're, after you're done with this, at some point you're going to get over on the racetrack and drive some of these cars. Around. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, uh, what are some of the things of, if someone catches you in a hotel or a, uh, an, an airport uh, bar and, and just wants to have a conversation over a beer, what are some of the things that you enjoy talking about or you're interested in that have nothing to do with golf? What do you do to kind of unplug from golf? I, uh, I like Victor. I watch a lot of uh, movies, shows. <laughs> uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts. Oh, okay. Uh, I have one to recommend yeah. to you. So, <laughs> Yeah. No, I've listened to this one a bunch. And, uh, you know, it's, it's spent a lot of hours with podcasts, and it's perfect for long drives or – um, you know, flying, you can download them and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, mainly it's series or yeah, shows, movies, uh, a lot of music, um, and that's about it, really. You know, because when you're traveling, there's not really that much to do. Yeah. Uh, and usually, when you've been practicing all day, you don't want to then be a tourist for four or five hours in the afternoon. You know. So. No, of course. Well, and also I would imagine at this point your your kind of eyes are on the prize of okay, I need to get my work done at this this uh, this tournament. Yeah. And you know, you're, you're more looking. I'm assuming you're right now. You're just you know, how do I get myself in the best condition and my game in the best shape for for Q School mm-hmm. for for coming up this this fall? So I mean, right now my situation is that I've been playing every Monday qualifier, and I was fortunate enough to get an invite for this this week and. After this, we'll have to reevaluate and see what the best options are because, you know, if I'm being honest, like Monday qualifiers are really tough to, oh, to, yeah. uh, to chase, uh, even with web status. You know, everyone keeps telling you, that, oh, yeah, just, you know, just go Monday qualify and then just go win or just go play really good. And then, oh, yeah, sure. you know, so that they, they everyone tries to sell you that, yeah, like kind of like winning the lot- lottery, you know, it's like, yeah, just just do this and then you'll be fine, you know, and then you'll be you know, good to go. Um, and I'm more of a guy that I would like to get as many opportunities as possible. I like to play full tournaments where I can, you know, play four rounds and then, and then see where I'm at instead of just playing one round and then having to go home and then practice again. Um, so, so for me now, after depending like this tournament will, will have a lot to say in what I do the re- the remaining of the year. Um, Cause I'm not, I haven't been a huge fan of just traveling and chasing the Mondays, so to be want, honest. You want to be on a tour where you can kind of set somewhat of a schedule and, and, yeah. and be right. Because you're, yeah, that makes, that makes perfect sense. So you're probably thinking about Canada or uh, Latin America or challenge tour or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah I, I didn't sign up for any of the Q schools for Canada or Latin America, but uh, maybe, maybe the challenge tour could be an option. I mean, so, I, I mean, at this point, like, obviously I would love to play good here and, and get better status and then play the rest of the year and, you know, e- either have a full card for next year or even, you know, get my PGA Tour card. So that would be the ideal. But then what if what if I mon- or play every Monday and don't make it, you know, like yeah. then I'm sitting here in four months with really nothing. Yeah, no, you're 100%. Having to go back to Q school, so. Um, so that, that, that is a tough part. And a lot of guys, I see a lot of the same people at the Monday qualifiers and a lot of the guys have been doing this forever, you know, whereas maybe if they would have gone to a different tour, maybe even a lower level and develop and, you know, uh, you know, you can climb through their world rankings through that too. So, I mean, it's just, it's, it's tough just having to play one run a week. Uh, yeah, I and, I can't yeah. see how that helps you in the long run. I mean, yeah, if you catch lightning in a bottle, but you're trying to to and and so, uh, and, yeah. and also if you're you're just doing Mondays where you're where you're chasing a 64 or 63, more often than not you're not going to get through. I mean, that's just that's just the numbers of it. Only two or three yeah. guys get through, and mm-hmm. at some point that's just a lot of negative reinforcement. I'm thinking over and over and over yeah. again. Yeah, I mean, it, it's really hard to stay positive about it when you're doing the Mondays and barely missing out every time. 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, and even, even when you make it through, like I made it through the, uh, the one in Alabama, I mean, then you have to, you know, step up and play with that one week, you know? And I mean, some players have done it obviously, and it's very, it's doable, but you know, for of the course, you know, for a year, I mean, that, I don't know if that's sustainable. Right. No. Uh, just, just mentally. And especially if you want to work on things, you can't really work on, your swing or, or anything and then go back and okay, I need, I need to shoot eight under today. And then tomorrow I'll be back at work. You know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a little tough. Um, and that's your reality. I mean, that's probably 90% of what professional golf is all about because <laughs> yeah. you, you only see the PGA tour or the European tour and then the web, you know, and, and that's what people see on TV, especially like, you know, people thinking that you know, everyone's like shoots 65 every time and they don't, you know, what, what you see in a tournament on a Sunday, it's the best players in the world. And then there's only filming the, the best shots of right. that day, you know? So you, it, you don't really see what, you know, what, what it's like a hundred percent. Of course. But, um, but I mean, and I've, I've been fortunate enough to get a couple of invites for PJ tour events, which has been, has been really nice. So then I can, you know, compare and see where my game is at and what I need to improve. Well, and, uh, you, you, you yeah. mentioned, yeah, you mentioned that. I mean, that leads me, that perfectly leads me into, uh, you know, this, the, uh, the quick and loans. So you, you made your debut, your pro debut, I think it was last year, the quick and loans. And, yeah. you know, it's so funny. I mean, I know it, anyone that, you know, does a little research and, 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 you know, finds uh, your story is going to see that you were at a, a, a quick and loans as a kid, uh, getting a, you know, kind of a lesson from Tiger Woods that, mm-hmm. you know, whenever, uh, you know, PGA Tour players are at an event. There's always a junior clinic, and you always see the little kids run up with their hats and getting them signed and getting, you know, watching watching kids hit a shot. And they'll, they'll mess with your grip, and there's a great picture of Tiger doing that for you. And mm-hmm. then sure enough, that's where you make your pro debut. Yeah. Um, did you have a chance to kind of reconnect with him or even say hello to him at the tournament? I said hi to him, but, I mean, he was he seemed so busy, and I'm I'm not the guy that's gonna walk up to any player and just be like, hey, like my name is so and so, like sure. here's my number, like call me, you know. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that would have been hysterical if you did. Yeah, that, but uh, my my dad went up to him, and because it was through my dad that I got that opportunity, and I think it was 2005 that uh, he was running a uh, had a foundation helping uh, kids uh, in Mexico, like the sons of caddies and stuff, to to start playing the game of golf and was fortunate enough to take a bunch of kids up to uh i think it was in orlando uh to a tiger clinic and i got i got you know the opportunity to uh, to meet him and and get like a 15 minute uh clinic um so um so yeah i think my dad went up to him and he, my dad's not afraid to you know do anything like that he'll, <laughs> he'll walk up to anyone and just start talking and that's great so i think he, he had a few of the pictures and had tiger signed them and took a couple of pictures with him but um, yeah, he was he was more embarrassing at the time. But <laughs> looking back at it, he's 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 right most of the time. Oh yeah, you got to get that done. So you, yeah, that's that's awesome yeah. that he did that. I'm really appreciative of the time you've been able to share with me today here uh, at the back of the range. I know you're getting ready to 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 go after this web event, and and who knows where that's going to lead to. And yeah, um, yeah just uh, enjoy that, and and best of luck the rest of the year. And uh, we'll hopefully we can catch up and do it again sometime when you're uh, when you're on the pga tour next year for sure i like i like the sound of that and uh thanks for having me and there you have it another great episode here at the back of the range special thanks to chris ventura for joining us congrats again on the utah championship don't forget we're on facebook twitter and instagram keep leaving reviews and apple podcast all of our previous episodes are available at the back of the range.com enjoy the fourth of july we'll see you next week here at the back of the range